what every Adventist scientist should know, alcohol. We've been going over a series called What Every Adventist Scientist Should Know. We talked about the philosophy of science. We talked about is there a God and a number of subheadings there. Um, we have talked about how old is life on earth and was there a flood. Uh, going through several things that are well enough established that I think that Adventist scientists should hear about this. And uh, then we have talked to about challenges to young life creationism that are often thrown up by uh, Coconino Sandstone being actually a former challenge. The Yellowstone Fossil Forest being a former challenge, but a very strong one at, at one time. Uh, ice cores and radiometric dating. Ice cores, of course, was last week. And um, then we have talked about Ellen Height's health messages in general a couple weeks ago. And today we're finishing up the series on alcohol. Uh, we still have to get the origin of life redone because we didn't record it when we did it. But uh, we should be able to do that fairly soon. Alcohol, we're going to talk about several things. One of them is Ellen White and her position on alcohol. Two, we're going to discuss the biblical evidence in the record. We're going to discuss what I would call the old synthesis before we got uh, uh, complications. We're going to talk about those complications, the new claims that have been made that alcohol really is good for you in moderation. And then we're going to talk about the latest article. And when I say latest, I mean it came out in June 10. I did not plan this, honest. Uh, and then, of course, I'll give you my take, and then you guys can give me your take. Ellen White's position is fairly straightforward. It starts at the beginning when she first reported her health vision. This is from Spiritual Gifts, Volume 4. Stimulating drinks have been used freely, which have confused the brain and brought down man to the level of brute creation. While intoxicated, every degree of crime has been committed, and yet the perpetrators have been excused in many instances because they knew not what they were doing. This does not lessen the guilt of the criminal. If by his own hand he puts the glass to his lips, you can see what kind of intoxicant she's talking about, and deliberately takes that which he knows will destroy his reasoning faculties, he becomes responsible for all the injury he does while intoxicated at the very moment he lets his appetite control him, and he barters away his reasoning faculties for intoxicating drinks. Um, shades of our laws about driving drunk. Um, it, was by, it was his own act which brought him even below the brutes. And crimes committed when he is in a state of intoxication should be punished as severely as though the person had all the power of his reasoning facilities. That's a pretty strong statement. And uh, now we're going to get into the intoxication that she's talking about. Although it, it is interesting, it's not limited to wine. It is simply wine is an example. And so you can see we're talking about alcohol. Uh, among other things. Nadab and Abihu, by drinking wine, beclouded their reasoning facilities and so lost their sense of sacred things that they thought they could as well offer common fire as sacred. God did not excuse them because the brain was confused. Fire from his presence destroyed them in their sin. Some look, look with horror upon men who have been overcome with liquor and are seen reeling and staggering in the street, while at the same time they are gratifying their appetite for things differing in their nature from spiritist liquor, but which injure the health, affect the brain, and destroy their high sense of spiritual things. The liquor drinker has an appetite for strong drink, which he gratifies, while another has no appetite for intoxicating drinks to restrain, but he desires some other hurtful indulgence and does not practice self-denial any more than the drunkard. So here you have her actually using alcohol as a kind of leaping off point to saying, what about other things that cl be cloud the mind? I somehow doubt that she'd be real happy about the use of marijuana. Um, <clears throat> now, this carried all the way through her life. This is a ministry of healing, which is a good bit later. And just to give you a flavor, this is, by the way, talking about the economics of uh, alcohol. And, and in the few paragraphs before that, she's talked about the liquor seller who takes, who gets the guy in debt and then goes after his widow and kids' money because 
After all, the guy owes him the money for the drinks and uh, literally takes food out of their mouths. And, you know, you can, you can hear her as a uh, kind of a super mom going, you know, this is just not right. It's got to stop kind of thing. And you realize that this is in the era where prohibition was being advocated and Ellen White was active in that role. Houses of prostitution, dens of ice, criminal courts, prisons, almhouses, insane asylums, hospitals, all are to a great degree filled as a result of the liquor seller's work. Like the mystic Babylon of the apocalypse, he is dealing in slaves and the souls of men. I, you know, she is just cutting. Um, be, behind the liquor seller stands the mighty destroyer of souls. Guy's devil possessed. And every art which earth or hell can devise is employed to draw human beings under his power. In the city and in the country, on the railway trains, on the great steamers, in the places of business, in the halls of pleasure, in the medical dispensary, even in the church. On the sacred communion table, his traps are set. Nothing is left undone to create and foster the desire for intoxicants. On almost every corner stands the public house with its brilliant lights, its welcome and good cheer, inviting the working man, the wealthy idler, and the unsuspecting youth. Okay? Well, she's not done yet. He's got the men. In private lunchrooms and fashionable resorts, ladies are supplied with popular drinks under some pleasing name that are really intoxicants. For the sick and the exhausted, there are widely advertised bitters consisting largely of alcohol. So he's getting the women. Now he's going after the children. To create the liquor appetite in little children, alcohol is introduced into confectionery. Such confectionery is sold in the shops, and by the gift of these candies, the liquor seller entices children into his resorts. Kind of reminds you of the free cigarettes that they used to pass out. Now, it gets even more interesting. Uh, the Review and Herald, November 8, 1881. The advocates of temperance fail to do their whole duty unless they exert their influence by precept and example, by voice and pen and vote. Vote, of course, talking about the prohibition. In favor of prohibition and total abstinence. Now, that's taking the word temperance and giving it a slightly different twist. Temperance is supposed to be, uh, right, uh, uh, moderate in all things. Her idea of moderation here is nothing. Very clear. The Bible, now, to come back to uh, Ministry of Healing, the Bible nowhere sanctions the use of intoxicating wine. Whoa. Breathtaking statement. The wine that Christ made from water at the marriage feast of Cana was the pure juice of the grape. This is the new wine found in the cluster, which the scripture says, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. Strong. Well, what does the Bible say? Does it, let's go back to that. The Bible nowhere sanctions the use of intoxicating wine. Well, the uh, Bible does say some things that are very hard against wine. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. That's Proverbs 20. And, of course, in Proverbs 23, who has woe, who has sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, look thou not upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright, Looks like we're doing okay. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women. Thy heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth on the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. So the Bible does have some very strong condemnations of alcohol. And in this case, it looks like it's saying not even a little bit because 
you think you're doing okay, and it takes control. Well, actually, there's an interesting passage in uh, Proverbs 31, which says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Um, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. But then it goes on to say, String, give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. One could argue that the principle behind this would say that if people are having a lot of pain, you can give them morphine and it's okay if they are not totally awake. At least that's one way of reading that. So it suggests that maybe there is a kind of use for alcohol. Now, there are some problems. Uh, this is a Nadab and Abihu verse, uh, or chapter 10, and I'm going to skip a few verses because I don't want to spend all my time reading. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. You'll notice that it doesn't say anything in that part about alcohol. But if you keep going, you realize, oh, they may have been drunk at the time. And the Lord spake unto Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine, nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. So maybe it was that they got drunk, and then they went and offered strange fire. Hey, try this. Um, there's, a, there's an... There's an interesting point, though, that might be lighted over if you're not careful, and that is that we nowadays live in the New Testament era, and we don't have a class of priests, do we? Rather, we have what is known in Protestant theology as the priesthood of all believers. Interesting implications, aren't they? Well, Okay, so we've, we've given a good reason for most of us not to drink unless until, you know, we get riddled with cancer and have to uh, deal with severe pain, okay? But there are other texts that are a little bit more difficult uh, to fit into that paradigm. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves into the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. So that's alcohol. But, go on. She'll drink no vinegar of wine, no vinegar of strong drink. Okay, maybe they have a little alcohol in them. Neither shall drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes, nor dried. Whoa. That's uh, Leviticus 6. So he's going overboard. In fact, you keep going all the days of his separation. He shall eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husk. At this point, it looks like you completely separate yourself from the vine. Completely. Now it isn't alcohol anymore. It's actually grapes. That's what it looks like, doesn't it? Dry grapes, that's raisins, right? Um, now, of course, this is an Azurite vow, so you're, you know, you're making a special vow. You're making a special point. You also can't cut your hair, and, and um, if you touch a dead person, you have to cut your hair anyway and then start all over again. Well, those have infectious principles. Um, yeah, but, but see, if, uh, ordinarily, you can touch a dead person get um, uh, get cleansed and then wash in running water and then uh, after a while you were okay. So, um, 
But the, the Nazarite seems to go beyond what you actually technically have to do. Suggesting that there's, that the, that the lines are not just alcohol in this case. And in fact, we'll find that, you know, the lines start to get blurred in some places. But um, here's another one. Uh, this one is talking about Hannah and um, it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, as she spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she'd been drunken. And Eli said to her, How long wilt thou be drunken? And put thou away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink. I am not drunk. But I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. You see, the daughters of Belial, they drink. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. However, as we keep going, this is uh, chapter 9 of Proverbs. Wisdom hath built her house, she hath hewed out her seven pillars, she hath killed her beast, she hath mingled her wine. She hath also furnished her table, she hath set forth her maidens, she hath cried upon the highest places of the city. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither, for him that wanteth understanding, she, he's, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread, drink of the wine which I have mingled, forsake the foolish and live, and go in the way of understanding, and it goes on beyond that. But um, she's mingled her wine. Sounds like a favorable reference. Well, that wasn't really intoxicating wine. Mm -hmm. Um, moving on into the New Testament, now you have, and no man putteth new wine into old bottles, lest the old wine birth, does birth the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. And this is interesting because now we have two kinds of wine. One kind of wine can ferment and burst bottles. Now, it's called new wine. And in fact, oinon neon. Neo wine. Um, into old bottles. If not, the, the, the wine bursts the bottles. Now, notice that here it says the new wine birth, that the births the bottles. The new isn't in there. It's the wine bursts the bottles, and the, and the wine is lost, and the bottles are... Uh, e even there, the, the English does catch the translation, the wine is spilled and the bottles will be marred. And here again, finally, new wine into bottles new, although it's not used neon there, it's a, it's a word that's equivalent to uh, kainos, fresh bottles, if you like, uh, bottles of this season. And, and so now you have wine being used in a sense that you can have no alcohol in the wine or at least not very much. Certainly, it's not seasoned enough to where it's ready to, to uh, ferment. Uh, it, it can ferment and, and uh, it still has plenty of room to ferment, I should say. So, <clears throat> now you're dealing with the word wine being used in two different senses. One fermented, one non-fermented. Um, Oh my, did I do that? Yes, I did. Uh, and I omitted one of the, um, one of the texts I was going to quote. Um, but um, here's another interesting one. This is from Luke, and I've forgotten which chapter. No man uh, also having drunk old wine straightway the desireth new, for he says the old is better. Or if you're going to be technical, he says the old is useful or good. Um, 
it's, it, it's interesting. It, it doesn't actually say wine. It just says, no man drinking the old desires the new. Um, so the, the old is good. That has interesting implications for, uh, give me that old time religion, it's good enough for me, doesn't it? He's going, yeah. he's going for the mood effect if he's preferring the, the old to the alcohol, new. you know, and wine it, versus the new wine without and the in alcohol. Fact, in fact, we're, uh, we're going to come to that. Um, again, in the New Testament, you're going to see another line that's blurred. Um, this is uh, Acts 2, verse 13. And others mocking said, these are full of new wine. These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to you, men of Ju Judea and all the dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose. Seeing it's only the third hour, it's nine o'clock in the morning. People don't get drunk at nine. Um, the interesting thing is the, the Greek for verse 13 says these men are uh, uh, said that glucose, yeah, that's where we get our word glucose. Although interestingly, the, the, uh, the main, um, uh, the main uh, sugar in, in grape juice is usually fructose rather than glucose. But whatever, uh, those distinctions were not well known. We have a... Well, so the new wine is being used for Unfermented as well as fermented. Is that unless well, that's unless what this it's is, a, that's you're what saying it, this is mistranslated. Well, it looks like it looks like the new wine here, which is now glucose, not uh, not oinos neos, but glucose. That's grape juice, and I used to think that that was really strange. And and uh, until one day I was listening to a uh, broadcast on. Uh, uh, the radio station here that uh, does the news, KNX 1070, yeah. Uh, and uh, the guy was reporting that down in the uh, uh, down on the freeway, somebody had had a little too much grape juice. <laughs> and of course, he didn't mean grape juice. You know, he meant. Fermented grape juice, wine, because grape juice will not impair your driving of a car. So we do that in English too. There's, you know, we will use those kinds of expressions, kind of go around it. So you have to, when you're reading all of this stuff, you have to be careful to be sensitive to the context. How does the Hebrew word it there? Well, the, this is of course written in Greek originally, Greek. so. There is no Hebrew behind it. This uh, the glucose is the original. So you could you could say because they're mocking, so that in that sense they're being sarcastic. Oh yeah, this must be new wine, and implying it's really not. Exactly, exactly, and that's why if you hear the you can't go rigidly by the word. We've seen wine that is new that doesn't necessarily cause intoxication, and we are now seeing grape juice that does cause in intoxication. Yeah, right. So you, you have to be careful of how it's being used. And then, then there's a passage in um, Second Timothy, and I forget which chapter, but it's verse 23. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach sakes and thine often infirmities. And that happens to be uh, oligo, which most, uh, some of you who are medicine will recognize as few or little. Uh, oino. Oinas. Wine. Um, is he talking about the intoxicating kind? That's the usual meaning. Um, there is a, there is a uh, there is another passage that probably that I that I missed putting in, 
that uh, in um, Deuteronomy, where uh, uh, Moses is talking about, and if you live a long ways from the temple, uh, you can take your tithe and turn it into whatever you want. Uh, grain, meat, um, wine, strong drink, and then uh, make merry before the Lord. That comes pretty close to endorsing the use of wine. Um, now, well, what about the Last Supper? Well, one of the things that's interesting about the Last Supper is, and he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day which I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The fruit of the vine obviously has something to do with grapes. Um, the interesting thing of it is it says the cup. And if you want to be technical, it's a poterion. And uh, it's, uh, the fruit of the vine is actually a, a kind of an interesting translation. It's what comes from the vine. Almost sounds like Jesus is taking a Nazarite vow at this point. Uh, but the other thing that's interesting in this regard is that it never says wine anywhere. And I used to think, well, then, you know, that's a small hole to wiggle through, but uh, you know, maybe it was fresh grape juice. Until a um, few years back when the front of uh, Near Eastern archaeology, it had changed its name from biblical archaeology by then, had a papyrus that they had gotten from Elephantine. And it was somebody saying, and the Passover's coming, and don't eat anything of leaven, and don't drink anything of leaven. Don't eat anything of leaven, and don't drink anything of leaven. Which implies that they figured out that leaven was required to turn grape juice into wine. And it implies that maybe this is the fresh stuff, and this doesn't qualify for oinos, or wine. So, you can't really make a good case for the Lord's Supper being... Uh, being intoxicating just from the biblical record. And then, of course, there's finally the marriage of Cana, which is what Ellen White was talking about. And on the third day, there's a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and, and so forth. And as you go down, and he says, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. And uh, there are people who said, yeah, this is especially strong stuff. Um, and I used to think that that was a reasonable argument until a couple of experiences, well, about three experiences, uh, one with my brother-in-law and uh, two with my son, who went to a party where there was alcohol being served because uh, it was their uh, social duty to be there and um, brought their own, only brought grape juice, varietal grape juice, which you can get, uh, particularly sparkling catawba is what they make champagne out of. And uh, their stuff, in all three instances, disappeared before everybody else's stuff was touched. So apparently, Grape juice is preferred even by people who would normally get drunk, which is interesting. And so I think you can make a case that in, in this case, uh, Jesus may very well have made some really good grape juice and the, uh, the, the uh, master of the feast was recognizing this is great stuff. Why'd you save it till now? Now, 
From that, you can take a, a biblical synthesis, I think, that goes kind of like this. The Bible is very clearly against too much alcohol, and there's no, no dispute about that. One can argue that the bi biblical viewpoint is that a little alcohol is good, but too much is not. And if you look at all of those, you can say, well, you know, take a little wine, just a little bit. Uh, interesting to ask how much. One can argue that the biblical viewpoint discourages actual alcohol with not actually forbidding it. Um, I think it's hard to make a case for the Lord's Supper being alcoholic. I think it is also easy to make a case for the wine at Cana to be non-alcoholic. Um, I think the best case that I can make for Ellen White, at least the one I feel most comfortable with, is that the Bible nowhere sanctions the use of intoxicating wine. It would seem to be that at one time there was kind of permission to use wine. You can buy, uh, take your money and buy whatever you want, wine, beer, uh, food. Um, but that the ideal was never intoxication any more than it was divorce and demand or slavery, and that later Christianity caught up with the ideal. Now that makes a very comfortable uh, place for me to sit. Uh, one can go on and it, it synthesize this view of the biblical attitude with the idea that if alcohol was a drug, the 10% incidence of major side effects should dictate use only in life-saving situations. I mean, think about it. If, if you were being given a drug and you got out the little insert and it said there's a 10% incidence of, um, it's actually 8% for Caucasians and it's 20% for Native Americans and um, other races fall in between. But uh, is that cultural, is that uh, genetic? I'm not gonna argue. Uh, it's a fact. Um, in fact, 10% uh, of Adventists drink alcohol and 1% are alcoholics. It, we're just like everybody else. Um, the 10% the, uh, the incidence of major side effects, and major side effect, I mean loss of job, loss of spouse, loss of life in an accident or in... Um, uh, cirrhosis or various other diseases that are clearly alcohol related. Um, you know, those are major side effects. And if I was trying to prescribe a drug that had those kind of side effects, it had better cure cancer. Right? right? It's certainly not the kind of thing you'd use to make you feel good at a party. I mean, if I prescribed that, I would be sued for malpractice, right? Of course. So that's a, that's a good, solid synthesis, okay? But what if it did cure cancer? Um, the new claims are that, well, it doesn't cure cancer, but it has a huge salutary effect on heart disease. And I'm going to give you some of the evidence behind that. What about red wine and heart disease? And this is the question that is asked of the American Heart Association. Over the past several decades, this is their answer, many studies have been published in science journals about how drinking alcohol may be associated with reduced mortality due to heart disease in some populations. Now, of course, they're getting a little nervous about this. Some research, researchers have suggested that the benefit may be due to wine, especially red wine. Others are examining the potential benefits of compounds in red wine, such as flavonoids and other antioxidants, for reducing heart disease risk. Some of these components may be found in other foods, such as grapes or red grape juice, so why not take the great red grape juice instead? The linkage reported in many of these studies may be due to other lifestyle factors rather than alcohol. So let's such factors may include increased physical activity and a diet high in fruits and vegetables and lower in saturated fats. No direct comparison trials have been done to determine the specific effect of wine or other alcohol on the risk of developing heart disease or stroke. You notice that they say, yeah, there's these studies that show 
And then they go, um, but they haven't really been proven. Um, by the way, if you're looking for the reference, there is a reference. You, this is uh, out there. Um, the claim is made that there is a J-shaped, and some people will say U-shaped, but it's not U-shaped, and everybody knows it, that you don't get massive benefit. You get a little benefit, and then you get a huge tail as it goes up. I guess I should do this this way for you. Um, that, it's, that it's more of a J with a little bit of a rise at the end than it is a U. And we're going to see some of that uh, J shape in just a little bit. There are a number of studies that suggested a small positive effect of alcohol in health. It's not a huge one. Uh, but the fact that it's there says, well, you know, maybe if I drink just a little bit, I'll do better. And it, a review that, that claimed that, um, is, which is actually available on the Internet as well, um, but it's published in Postgraduate Medicine in uh, 2001, uh, just, just pick one, uh, says, and this is probably the bottom two-thirds of the uh, uh, abstract, I'm trying to be brief here. The beneficial effects of alcohol in the cardiovascular system have been touted since the 18th century, 1700s. Um, but the bulk of scientific research has accumulated over the last few decades. The majority of the literature suggests that alcohol, majority of the literature suggests that alcohol in moderation is beneficial in the cardiovascular system and excess is detrimental to overall health. The deleterious effects of heavy alcohol consumptions on health are numerous. Aerodigestive cancer, hemorrhagic stroke, and cardiomyopathy, hepatic cirrhosis, fetal alcohol syndrome, syndrome, fatal car crashes, and suicides. Just to name a few. Major side effects. Uh, however, these effects have not been documented among light to moderate drinkers. Um, what's wrong with that statement? <laughs> uh, by definition, if you're a light drinker, you're not going to have that. If you drink once every, uh, one glass every week, you know, you're not going to have well, you might have the accident, though. You might get a ticket. Uh, but the question, of course, is do you, do you get to decide to be only a light to moderate drinker, or does drink take over? Um, we have a question over here. Uh, can we pass the mic over? I was thinking maybe they get a DUI anyway. Well, of course, if you want to say light to moderate drinker, you can always... Uh, go ahead. In addition to your point, I would add, we have pretty good evidence now that there's no threshold level of drinking below which your uh, cancer risk, overall cancer risk, is not increased compared with a teetotaler. And there's great data on breast cancer, invasive uh, ductal carcinoma in particular, with light to moderate drinking even. So okay. I would add so, that to this discussion. So, uh, so uh, maybe it doesn't cure cancer, maybe it causes cancer, in which case it better be I really good. I think there's pretty good evidence for that now, and it's been mounting just over the last few years. Okay, can you pass the mic down? We have another comment here. Go ahead. What about the effect of even minimal alcohol on a pregnant, on the fetus on a pregnant woman? Uh, yeah, that's true. And, and in fact, I think that the statement of this has not been documented in among light to moderate drinkers is probably... Uh, in error, uh, because certainly moderate drinkers can get fetal alcohol syndrome in the kid. Uh, pass it down, there's another comment here. Uh, down. Yeah, so just to get back to the question that you asked about, um, you know, being able to pick and choose, are you a light or moderate drinker, or you know, do you become an alcoholic? I think that's the question you were asking. I think uh, there's uh, mounting evidence that it's uh, largely genetically determined, and absent genetic testing, you're not going to really know that uh, prior to starting. That is true. Well, um, 
to uh, to get to the some of the attitude behind the enthusiasm for having this kind of stuff. Uh, this is from the Huffington Post, uh, reacting to the recent article in the Medi uh, British Medical Journal. And if I did it right, uh, we'll have the re reference to that. I'm awfully fond of the advice to drink wine in moderation. Bias, anyone? It introduces us uh, to the non, I guess that should be, it introduces us to the non-intuitive understanding that many things in nature have an inverted U relationship. A little bit is good, adding some more doesn't improve outcome, but high levels of the same, quote, healthy substance make it toxic and not healthy at all. Vitamins behave this way and so does homework. Why even too much honesty can turn you cruel. A little bit of alcohol is fine, a lot more is not good. So good, uh, some is good, more is not better is a common principle of healthy lifestyle. And in general, I would agree. Uh, the question is, does that hold for alcohol? Uh, I did put in the reference, uh, Huffington Post. Um, um, uh, there's a couple of articles that actually go back a ways, and one of them anyway. This one is oh, 1988, Lancet. Uh, and this is also available on the internet, uh, or at least the, the abstract is. And this one talks about a prospective study of uh, 7,735 middle-aged, um, and I don't know what the seven British men, uh, 504 of whom died in a follow-up period of 7.5 years. There was a U-shaped relationship between alcohol intake and total mortality, and an inverse relationship with cardiovascular mortality, even after adjustment for age, cigarette smoking, and social class. These mortality patterns were seen in all smoking categories, with ex-smoking non-drinkers having the highest mortality. I wonder why they quit. Um, and were observed in manual but not uh, in non-manual workers. The alcohol, in other words, you work hard, I guess alcohol is good for the drinking, uh, for the working class. Um, but they go on to say the alcohol mortality relationships, total and cardiovascular, were present only in men with cardiovascular or cardiovascular related doctor diagnosed illnesses at the time of initial examination. So if you're healthy, don't drink just to stay healthy. I guess that's what they're saying. But they go on to say um, the data suggests that the observed alcohol mortality relationships were produced by pre existing disease and by the movement of men with such disease into non-drinking or occasional drinking categories. The concept of a protective effect of drinking on mortality, ignoring that dynam dynamic relationship between ill health and drinking behavior, is likely to be ill-founded. So what happens is the non-drinkers are stacked with former drinkers or with people who move from, well, I take a little alcohol now and then to, you can't do that because your high blood pressure medicine won't allow you to drink or something of that nature. So uh, there's all kinds of confounding factors that people haven't thought of. Um, one of the confounding fa factors is ex-drinkers uh, could be classified as non-drinkers. And the ex-drinkers could be heavy drinkers, okay, could be people who quit because of alcohol-related illnesses, or perhaps other diseases, or perhaps other medications that, uh, that interact with diseases. So there are, they're going to be less healthy than average and yet they're going to be put in the non-drinking category. So you have to watch out for that bias. Uh, non-drinkers also could be unstable people who, if they drank, would be cold out of the light drinkers into the heavy drinkers very rapidly. In other words, they're people who are unstable in general, and they stay non-drinkers. They don't drink, and so they stay non-drinkers. But if they were to try to get into the light drinkers, they would rapidly move into the heavy drinkers. And so that the heavy drinkers have, the light drinkers have these people filtered out of them, so to speak. Um, and finally, there's a third factor that has come in recently, and that is that people who are trying to do their very best to maintain their health. And they have heard that you need to drink just a little bit. So they drink just a little bit. These people are highly motivated to have other health habits. And so they're likely to be more healthy in general. 
And so what's happening is that people are getting moved into the light drinkers who are healthy on, on baseline. Now that's not saying that we can say for sure whether those confounding factors account for all of the uh, all of that J-shaped curve, but it's something to keep in mind. And in fact, it's been known for some time. Fillmore et al. Moderate Alcohol Risk, uh, and that's in Addiction Research and Theory in 2006. Um, many studies included former drinkers with abstainers, and this is. You know, this is obviously an error. You really don't want to do that. And many studies included occasional drinkers with abstainers. Um, and if you correct those errors, a curve that originally looked like this, this is former drinkers, this is non-drinkers, and you'll see the risk uh, definitely goes well below, the, uh, the two sigma variation goes well below one. Uh, and then it comes back up. It has the J shape that we've talked about before. Um, uh, now, once you correct those errors, or you find studies that didn't make those errors, all of a sudden, the shape of the J shape curve has markedly lessened, and you can't say statistically that it actually exists. And that's really kind of an egregious error. Well, how did it get missed? Well, somebody wasn't reading very closely. We tend to look harder at data that seem to point in directions we don't wish to go. And there is a bias. Now, of course, there's a bias the other way, too. And maybe these guys had the appropriate bias to find the errors. Science is practiced. We'd like to say it's objective. It isn't. Uh, there are risks to alcohol therapy, and we went over that. 88% of Caucasians who drink will become alcoholics, and roughly 20% of Amerindians who drink will become alcoholics. Just to give you the, the, uh, the numbers behind it. Um, now, the latest article just came out, and I do mean just came out, 2014, the 10th of July. I did not plan this, honest. Um, Association between alcohol and cardiovascular disease, Mendelian randomization analysis based on individual participants' data. And um, it can be found in the, uh, uh, on the internet. The British Medical Journal put it up, which is very nice of them. You'll notice it's Holmes MV et al. If you go to the website, you will find that there are two pages of authors. Why is that? Because they went over about 50 studies and they tried to get every single study to, to look at, well, do these people have this particular gene? And uh, the abstract, their objective was to use the RS122984 variant in the alcohol dehydrogenase 1B gene as an instrument to investigate the causal role of alcohol in cardiovascular disease. That's a gene that interferes with alcohol metabolism. And so they, Mendelian, they use Mendelian genetics to kind of quasi-randomize. People don't have a choice as to whether they get this gene or not. Um, they were dealing with individuals of European descent. I doubt that it's restricted to that, but it could be. Um, and you'll notice that they're talking about 261,000 individuals. So this is a huge study when they did it. Basically what they did is they found everybody who had a study on it and they said, well, can we test your guys' blood for this enzyme? Um, and the, their, uh, they were looking at coronary heart disease and stroke to see whether it has a cardioprotective uh, effect. And you'll notice that the carriers of this gene consumed 17.2% fewer units of alcohol per week and had a lower ev uh, ev prevalence of binge drinking and high, higher abstention than non-carriers. And they also had lower, uh, uh, they, they didn't weigh as much, surprise. And uh, 
The protective association of, that, of this gene remained the same across all categories of alcohol consumption. So the gene is helpful no matter where they put you in. Their assumption was that if you have the gene, you drink less. Because every time you drink, you get flushed. And it's very uncomfortable. And so, um, and so you, within each category, if, if you drink less, you uh, have better health. So pray that your uh, parents gave you that gene. Uh, either that or don't drink. Um, and their conclusions was individuals with a genetic variant associated with non-drinking and lower alcohol consumption had a more favorable cardiovascular profile and a reduced risk of coronary artery disease than those without the genetic variant. This suggests that reduction of alcohol consumption even for light to moderate drinkers is beneficial for cardiovascular health. There went our excuse to use it to uh, cure cancer. Well, to cure heart disease. Um, they go on to point out that alcohol is the fifth leading risk factor for death and disability, counting for 4% of life years lost due to disease. Tobacco being ahead of it, of course. Um, and, you know, there's all these harmful effects. Uncertainty remains concerning the potential protective effect of light to moderate alcohol consumption on the risk of coronary artery disease and stroke. So maybe it protects, maybe it doesn't, and they're reviewing this. Um, observational studies have consistently reported, um, I don't know, that was in the original, that compared with non-drinkers, light to moderate drinking exhibits reduced cardiovascular risk with the lowest risk found at approximately 12 to 25 British units per week, while heavier and more hazardous drinking is associated with an increased risk resulting in the well-established U-shaped association. Again, that's not U, it's actually J, but. Um, however, the apparent cardioprotective effect associated with the light to moderate drinking cannot be, could be explained by an elevated cardiovascular risk from underlying poor health in non-drinkers or by confounding with lifestyle or social factors associated with light to moderate drinking. And of course, you can look up those references. Uh, the carriers of this gene cannot metabolize alcohol well, and so they get this big flush. They basically, it, alcohol dehydrogenase doesn't work the way it's supposed to. They drank less, they binge drank less, and they had lower gamma GT levels, which indicates that they didn't damage their livers as much. No big surprise there, actually. But they also had lower cardiovascular mortality than the general population, even when you stratify for alcohol consumption, which suggests that it isn't a J-shaped curve after all. So they said they can't metabolize alcohol? Because you would metabolize it faster, because that's a rate-limiting step, and you'd have more aldehyde, and that's yeah, what gives you know, the you, interesting that's what gives thing you is, the flushing. The interesting, uh, and we're going to come back to that, because the thought is that the mutants were randomly assigned to drink less alcohol by nature. And, that's the, and they were also, unfortunately, they were also randomly assigned to be more affected by the alcohol that they did drink because when they drink, it doesn't get metabolized as fast. And so they drink less, but they get more effect out of it. So are we sure that this is the final study? Now, you know, I don't think so. They're also mostly non-drinkers rather than ex-drinkers, and we're less likely to quit because of some medication issues so that those people, if they're in the non-drinking category, probably fairly belong there. And it looks like they have lower mortality when they're there. And finally, they were less likely to become heavy drinkers if they did drink. They're not going to go off the wall because yeah, they pay for it too fast. Uh, now, as the accompanying editorial in the British Medical Journal notes, this is unlikely to be the last word. However, it does call into question an uncritical acceptance of that J-curve. Maybe it's more of a straight line. And it, I think it makes the argument that the side effects are too dangerous for a party drug more effective arguments. I don't think we can be confident that alcohol cures heart disease or even ameliorates it. And therefore, I think it becomes harder to justify light alcohol intake. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Uh, we have a comment back here. Uh, I'm going to hand the mic up. 
Well, Brian Bull's my classmate, so I interact with him. And the original article that came out that proposed that light drinking was beneficial, he pointed out that the two groups were not identical. The, those that were supposedly were beneficial, who were more educated, more well off, and had greater access to medical care in general. So the Arctic was, he, Brian said, it was of no value. In, um, fact, in fact, that article, which he's probably referring to, was the groups that were, com that were in comparison. I mean, this is an egregious error in epidemiology, the groups that they were comparing were inner-city former drinkers who were ill with highly educated, um, they, yes, they were upper middle class people of high income who were professionals. I mean, we don't do this. Uh, I would and have to they, agree they got you. They got criticized for it a long time later, years later, in an editorial in New England Journal. But by that time, the meme had yeah. been put in and, and obviously created hundreds of papers. <laughs> um, uh, uh, bring it down. Uh, it's comment in the front. So there's a factor here that I think really needs to be controlled for, which is um, frequency of social interaction. So in the secular world, you know, uh, moderate drinkers are typically people who are more social. And as we know from studies of you know, uh, public health in the Adventist community, uh, social interaction, frequent social interaction, and connectedness with your community is something that has a, a huge positive impact on health. And I, I don't think any of those studies you cited controlled for that. That's true. Uh, now, to, to, to make a point on that, uh, it's possible that, the, that some kind of this randomization there's another, uh, there's another mutation in um, acetaldehyde uh, dehydrogenase in uh, Asians, which is apparently a fairly frequent uh, uh, mutation, uh, where they basically, those people are uh, kind of as if they were taking antabuse all the time. And they can't drink because they get flushing, but it's worse than, it's worse than the mutation we've been talking about. And it would be very interesting to see what happens to those people, because I suspect that those people are actually going to come out quite nice in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of what happens. Um, I mean, one of the huge problems we have is people move from one category to another. People who used to drink a little bit now move into the non-drinker category. People who used to drink, not drink at all move into the drinker category. And of course, people move back and forth from the heavy drinker to the light drinker, and um, uh, or all the way from a heavy drinker to an ex drinker, and I think that you have to you have to control for those movements and why they happened. If a guy quits drinking because he gets cirrhosis and then he dies early, you can't count him as a non drinker. I mean that's just kind of obvious. Uh, here and uh, then over here. And then back. What they might need to do is do like what we do with smoking. How many uh, pack years you have? You kind of need to uh, have how many, uh, uh, what is it, uh, six pack uh, years? Yeah. And in fact, uh, there's an interesting study that, that showed that smoking, um, that ex smokers have a higher incidence of lung cancer than smokers. But if you think about it, the reason they're ex smokers is because they got so bad they had to quit. And uh, maybe even they were having developing subclinical symptoms, and uh, then stopped, and then uh, and then the cancer is discovered, and of course then it's the fault of they quit smoking. Uh, I don't think so. Go ahead. About the verse, "Take a little wine for thy stomach's sake." In the 1930s, my dad had his own self-supporting missionary hospital in uh, Mexico, and uh, they didn't have antibiotics and a guy came in from the bar with 16, uh, 12 knife holes in his stomach. Ordinarily they would get infection and die of their intestinal wounds. 
But uh, he'd been drunk with no food for two weeks. So take a little wine for your stomach's sake in such circumstances. <laughs> Somehow I don't think that that's a generalizable uh, prescription. Uh, go ahead there and then here. The effects of alcohol on your health are all well and good, and I don't think any of us here would choose to drink alcohol because we thought it was a little bit better for our health. Um, to me, it's a very spiritual thing, and the reason I choose or not choose to drink alcohol has to do with my relationship with God. Um, and it all comes down to the verse in Revelation where Christ says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hears my voice uh, and opens the door to me, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. The idea here is that Christ is a gentleman, and he will not impose his will upon you unless you invite him to. But the devil is not like that. And any time you give him an opportunity, any time you let down the guard of your mind, he will come in and rape your mind, and I'm not joking. You put alcohol in, the devil comes out. And any time you lose the inhibition, your own God-given right to control your brain, the devil will be there to take advantage of you. And so for me, it's, it's strictly a, I'm never putting a drink of alcohol in my mouth because I don't want to be possessed. It doesn't matter if it cures cancer. I don't care if it cures cancer. And it doesn't <laughs> cure cancer. Um, <laughs> What, what I'm saying is that there's a difference between those spiritual powers and what those two spiritual powers will do. And Christ waits for an invitation before he impresses his will upon us. The devil does not wait for an invitation. And so you must be, because we are wrestling, we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, we're wrestling against principalities and spiritual darkness. We must be on our constant guard. Um, and and I, I'm just not willing to take that risk. I'm not willing to let go of my inhibitions, whether that's by overeating, whether that's by drinking, whatever, whatever ability that is. Uh, I'm not willing to let that go because I know the devil will be right there to take advantage of me. And then so a lot, yeah, lots to say on this. Um, so I worked with this issue for a long time. And well, you're, so you're, a, you're an alcohol rehab specialist or something yeah. like that? So, so I've had uh, access to the medical students uh, for, at the sophomore level for about eight years where I did an anonymous questionnaire. And uh, it was about 24 to about 46 percent of the uh, Loma Linda students that have positive family history. So certainly there's uh, genetics um, uh, going on, but there's more than genetics uh, too. So, so even in an abstinence environment and culture, subculture, the family history is still uh, significant. We get about three to five students every class that have alcohol or drug related problems. I'm tracking um, about 20 residents right now that have had drunk drivings. Uh, and ever since we've had our well-being committees, we've had, which I'm the chairman at uh, here as well as the VA, uh, we, we've had uh, several attendings that we deal with. And these are not the klutzes. These are, a lot of them are top of the game, MD, PhDs, heads of sections. So it's not the, the bottom ranks that end up having problems, it's the, the smart guys. And I could give you a whole litany of all this. So I used to feel, when I was at medical meetings, I used to feel a little defensive uh, or a little self-conscious about not drinking and a little defensive about you know total abstinence. Um, but as I've worked with physicians now and professionals, uh, I've been on a state committee for physicians for seven years and lawyers for two years, nurse, I'm currently on nurse diversion committee. And the, the reality is, um, yeah, there's risk factors, yeah, there's genetics, but even you can have people with perfect zero risk factors who just being exposed to the substance uh, develop a problem. I, have, I could give you lots of stories on, on true, true social drinkers, so infrequent, never more than a couple, never got inebriated, never drinking for the mood effect, no drug problems, perfect upbringings, uh, and so forth, uh, just being exposed, um, th that then switch from true social drinking to problematic drinking. It could be at any decade, could be you were a true social drinker for 10 years, and then in your 20s, or your 30s, or 40s, or not until you retire. So, so it's, it's I, I've not seen something you can predict. Some guy's wife dies and all of a sudden he turns to the bottle. And he's been controlled all of his life. Yeah. So another way that I'd like to turn this around too, so who would you clearly, it would be a no-brainer to clearly advise not to drink. So they come into you and they say, Doc, you know, all this, I, every time I open the internet and news is telling me to drink, what do you think? 
So who would you clearly advise not to drink? Well, cer certainly people with alcohol and drug problems, certainly family histories, certainly anybody less than 25, right? Because 15 to 25 year olds, the leading cause suicides, accidents, and homicides of which substance use is uh, clearly women. So, uh, so breast cancer issue, childbearing issue, and fetal alcohol syndrome. Anybody on with a medical problem, right? So, or on a medication. So, anybody that we're seeing as physicians, you'd be nervous about advising. Drinking causes high blood pressure, among other things. So, five to fifteen percent of hypertension is because of drinking, and just stop the alcohol, and their blood pressure improves. So, you go through the whole. Uh, anybody operating heavy machinery, elderly who are on elderly in general, so higher risks of falls and accidents and so forth. By uh, the time you get done with the list, there's nobody left. So it's, it's the middle-aged, you know, <laughs> white Caucasian or Caucasian male, and I still would like to see the, the study of comparing aspirin versus alcohol. Is it a, are we talking an antiplatelet effect? What are we really talking? And again, as has been said, people who are moderate uh, in alcohol are uh, a lot of times moderate in other things and having so it's so we need to be careful about uh, latching on to alcohol it, it's not just red wine it's any alcohol <clears throat> in some studies it's what is a drink a month so clearly what does a drink a month do to you physiologically so, so, that so protects clearly you? I mean, it's something else that's going on that's contributing to this so so that's my sound bite so. uh, comment there and there and Like, it's like the studies, uh, you know, if you drink a glass of milk, is it going to help you? Well, there's all these other factors. They have to, they have to separate those factors. But what I was going to comment on is, you know, what the, the ingredient in wine, it's supposed to, resveratrol. It's, I think it's an uh, antioxidant, essentially. Or something like that, but um, yeah. anyway, if they've done studies specifically on that in comparison with wine itself, because resveratrol has no alcohol in it, it's just resveratrol. I, I don't know the answer to that. I haven't yeah, seen that. One. Would be a good one to compare the two, because it doesn't have it has all the good things without any of the bad things. I have heard Adventists say they use a little alcohol in cooking, and the uh, cooking does something, disappears, it's all right. Uh, well, it probably does. Uh, it, no. One thing to remember is that, I don't know, if, if you had like two milliliters of alcohol, it's probably not going to do anything for you. But then it's not going to have me much fun either. So, uh, you know, why are we fighting this battle at that point? There are studies out of the federal government that show that it does not all cook out. And there's a lot of, average, of um, stuff saying don't even give candy to your children that has alcohol in it. Lots of chocolates have alcohol in the centers. So there's plenty of evidence that alcohol is not cooked out, in spite of what the Adventists would like to argue. I have a comment over here. Oh, also, another thing is the, like, people that are very into dieting or whatever, um, health, uh, combination, food com combining, they say that al your alcohol is developed inside of your body if you don't, if you combine the wrong kinds of foods and things like this. It's yet another well, factor. Well, in Prohibition, they used to, uh, Fleischmann's yeast used to sell the yeast and then they'd tell you to, to eat a bunch of sugary foods and you could cook your own brew and nobody could stop you. So, uh, no, how effective that was, I don't know. The, the, the real question is, if it's effective at all, are you doing the kinds of things, lowering your inhibitions, uh, basically uh, giving whatever powers are out there permission to do whatever they want with you? And, uh, you know, this is one of the things that's very interesting. Uh, one of the guys said, uh, if we isolate what it is out of red wine, we should not use that because it's in such a wonderful form to begin with. Uh, you know, there, there is, there is, uh, there's obvious, um, if I can say that way, bias <coughs> towards this kind of thing. Um, and I wonder whether it influences the judgment of the researchers and the judgment of the reviewers. 
I, this last week I saw a list of the top 50 sources of resveratrol. And this included spices and all common food items. Red wine is way down on the list. Many, uh, do, many do substances. Do have it, by the way? Um, yes. Okay. But uh, many, many substances were higher than any grapes, uh, especially some of the spices. And there's all kinds of substances with resveratrol in it that were higher. Um, and then another phenomenon that I've been watching that I find most curious is that a group of health practitioners that have often recommended wine in the past were the functional medicine alternative care practitioners. Some of them are physicians. Some of them are very highly, I mean, you know, they're Harvard people and so on. And then many are, well, naturopaths, okay, multiple alternative practitioners. These folks are going more and more away and are blatantly saying, do not take wine because they're concerned with the fermentation byproducts. They are dealing with uh, the epigenetics of their clients. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with huge issues in methylation. Alcohol profoundly wipes out methylation if you've got any problem, especially with the MTHFR mutation, which about half of us have, at least one allele. Um, and then, they're, well, they're concerned about the effects of the, um, well, just the fermentation byproducts and clearing them as toxins in the body uh, through the methylation system, even through the cytochrome P50 system. So overall, I'm seeing a dampening of discussion of alcohol, which Five years ago, I heard lots of discussion to finally many of them saying, no, don't, don't use alcohol, don't use it at all. And if I'm working with you, you can't drink because I can't get you cleared, I can't get you healthy again. So, comment. So, so that's another point on this, this whole thing of epigenetics now that, that exposure to certain things influences uh, gene expression and so clearly we know with the substance, with drugs, you have downstream effects and then uh, gene expression differences and then passing that on. So I'm not sh uh, sure about the alcohol, whether that's been looked at. But So now it's clear why these verses in the Bible talk about unto the third and fourth generation and, and maybe even unto the 20th generation is it's, it's not just original genetics, it's epigenetics and what we're exposed to in the environment now being passed on. Just wanted to touch on a topic in this area that nobody's mentioned yet, and that is the taste. I tasted it, and it was from a Napa Valley, a very good wine place. They were giving little samples, and it was just a little bit, and I could, I had one taste of a white wine and a red wine, and that's all I could handle because to me, it tastes like rotten, and I'm saying literally rotten grapes with ye a strong flavor of yeast. <laughs> that, it was foul tasting, and I don't know. I mean, if someone were to recommend it, and I knew it was okay to have it because I had some ailment, that's only way. I mean, it would like be have to be like a medicine because... To me, it's the most disgusting stuff I've ever tasted. <laughs> well, you know, this is one of the interesting things is that, is that people get used to tastes. Tastes are malleable. Uh, smells are malleable, and I'll, I'll give you an example. I, 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 how many of you have smelled benzoin? Um, it smells terrible, right? Unless you're a surgeon. And then it smells wonderful because what it says is, we're getting done, right? Yeah, you know, but uh, no, it, it's a very strong smell, and, and if you're uneducated and you didn't, nobody said anything about it, it's a disagreeable smell. But once it gets associated with something good, it becomes a good smell. And I think that that's what's happening with, with, uh, with alcohol, 
You know, it's very interesting. You watch the, um, the advertisements, and they all say, tastes great. What does that mean? The other guys don't, right? Well, they say the puppy dog food tastes great, too. Uh, well, you know, it tastes great, less filling, you know, that kind of, that, those kind of ads. Uh, they're, they're playing off of something that, you know, really doesn't taste that good. And ours tastes better than the other guys. That's what, that's what they're saying. And, and I think what happens is that people associate the smell with the feeling. They like the feeling. And so the smell becomes okay. But your experience, and I think the experience that I was relating about my son and my brother-in-law, uh, where they set out the, you know, the, uh, the grape juice and put it head to head to the wine and didn't tell anybody you have to drink this or you have to drink that. The grape juice disappears. <laughs> and I mean, it's reproducible. You know, if you want to try it sometime, if you're stuck in a, a someplace where, uh, you know, people are not all teetotalers, try it sometime. I bet you that that's uh, reproducible in your case too. Well, there's some uh, on the... Oh, oh okay. And uh, we've comment there in, I think that's... Feeding off just a little bit on what you were saying okay. about advertising, Gary and I were noticing this week that we get a lot of magazines now that we're retired. And one that really struck us was the Sunset Magazine. Sunset Magazine used to be about places you go and how to redo your houses, and there's still some of that in there, but page after page after page is on, here's what you need to drink on this day, and here's the best restaurant to go to drink, and it's a magazine on California wine. It's really not what it was intended to be initially. We're going to actually let it drop. We don't care to drink about wine. I mean, read about wine. However, I've been taking Jarrett's all for years. I know it's not a good thing. <laughs> no, he hasn't. <laughs> okay, uh, Mickey, and then pass back. Or, uh, uh, the thing I was going to say is that it's interesting that the reason uh, people don't drink is the same reason people do drink. So if they get a mood effect, some don't like that mood effect. They don't like that being altered, and for others, it's that's what they want. I had one patient. He'd read all the, the PDR, all the black box, the meds with black box warnings, and that's the meds he would take, because that's the way he wanted to feel. So, so there's some interesting uh, elements there of, of wanting versus not wanting that mood effect. So. You know, it raises an interesting question. If you, if you want to feel different from what you do now, there must be something wrong with the way you're feeling now. I was going to say, um, other cultures, when they see a lot of our food, it's, it's disgusting to them. Uh, like, for an example, uh, it, talking about bacteria, cheese, if you think about aged cheese, you take milk, you let it kind of rot, and then the bacteria is eating away at it, and of course, it's basically defecating all over the cheese. This is all part, I mean, look at Limburger. <laughs> Limburger is uh, incredibly... Uh, disgusting smell and that's a uh, gourmet cheese and we're feeding our kid you know most people not us hopefully but most people feeding their kids pizza all that every meal practically okay over here well Paul I think you hit on the uh, on the essence of what this is about um, which is uh, our mood and, and how we feel we are emotional beings God is an emotional being and if we want to feel emotionally appropriate uh, we try to do that lots of ways, but the only way to do that is through the gift of the Holy Spirit. We know that's promised in the Bible that the Holy Spirit gives you love and joy and peace. And if you were to ask anyone in the world, what do you really want out of life? They'll say things like happiness and security and love. And, and God is the only way to achieve that. And if you don't have God, if you don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit, you're going to be looking for that somehow. And women typically try to find a man to, to, to fill that, that emptiness inside. And it usually doesn't work. Um, the divorce rate is very high. They put this man on this pedestal of, you're going to be doing all these things for me. And then when he fails to fulfill those emotional needs that she has, uh, you know, it, it, it's devastating. Um, and the, the fact is, is only God can do that. And so people turn to many different things to, f to fulfill that. And, and mind-altering drugs are just one of the uh, God alternatives that the devil has produced. 
Now, it, I want to draw that out just a little bit further. Supposing we had the perfect drug, okay? It doesn't harm your liver. It allows you to run machinery. It goes away when you want it to. Um, in the meantime, it alters your mood and feel, makes you feel wonderful. Would this be the, would this be the drug that uh, we should all take? Nothing can replace God. And there's no, there's, there's no physical substance on this world that is going to uh, replace the human's need of God. That, that a drug like that would actually be harmful by its precise properties that are altering our consciousness. Yes. Um, well, yeah, let's see. As that got me off of the subject, but um, uh, if you, um, oh, just wait, I'll, I'll get it. Just go to somebody else. <laughs> well, I just, I'm, I would like to just be able to feel my feelings. I don't want to be deprived of feeling sad or angry or guilty or happy? Well, I think that we should probably close it at that.